So everything we do in our fancy scientific way that we do it is trying to design ways to climb the mountain and drop the person back into the other side of the mountain towards good health. Right. We're very passionate about this, not just because the science is exciting and how cool is it to be thinking about how to make a chronic illness that's been around for 30 years go away. That's pretty awesome kind of goal, but also that we're helping our veterans to serve this country and they deserve this. I have two incredible guests today. I have Dr. Nancy Klimas, the director of the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine, and Sergeant First Class Retired, Jimmy Orocho. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Absolutely. Dr. Klimas, you have created this incredible institute. Can you tell me a little bit about our work right now with Gulf War illness? I would be happy to. Um, I, a lot of people may not realize that during the many conflicts in the Gulf. There have been different types of toxic exposures that our veterans have um, seen and have had health consequences. Um, so at the first Gulf War, the 1990-91 Gulf War, when Kuwait was liberated by Jimmy and his many colleagues, uh, which was amazing, there was this perfect storm of toxic exposures. It was dreadful. Between the organophosphates that were being used as pesticides sarin gas that was actually released into the atmosphere during during the um, conflict and shortly afterwards, and uh, the amazingly intense exposures to oil well fires, our Gulf War veterans' poor little detoxification systems got overwhelmed, and about one in three became chronically ill. It has now been 33 years, now 32 years, since uh, the Gulf War, and one in three Gulf War veterans one in three of the 800,000 plus veterans that went to the Gulf from the United States are still ill today from the exposures that they had at that time. It's a terrible illness. And basically what happened was they had a pretty bad toxic hit that affected their brain and caused a chronic brain inflammation, chronic brain oxidative stress situation that resulted in um, just a sort of vicious cycle of chronic ill health ever since. And and Jimmy, Dr. Klimas just alluded to that you were there. Yes. And so can you share a little bit about your experience being there, what it was like being there, and if you were cognizant or aware of this exposure as you were having it? Oh, very cognizant. Um, yes, I did deploy to the Persian Gulf War, 1990, 1991. We call it Desert Shield, Desert Storm, two major campaigns. The Desert Shield was mostly in defense. The Desert Storm was the um, operations, military operations where we liberated Kuwait. Um, we were all cognizant of the uh, airborne hazards. Uh, we we monitored uh, chemical alarms that were going off. Uh, we had scud attacks, which are basically missile attacks from overhead. Uh, the oil well fires, which was done as a as a as an offensive measure to cloud the battlefield and to show the anger of the enemy. Um, experienced every bit of that in the, in the seven month deployment. And, and that I can't even fathom what that was like. And, and Dr. Klimas, I'm going to take just a step back here for a second. At the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, we do tremendous amount of translational research. We have quite an intimate relationship with the veterans healthcare centers. Can you give me a little bit, or just like our listeners, a little bit of indication of how this relationship came about? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, actually, from the very start, when we created the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, um, I had already had a 20, 30-year history, 25-year history at the Miami VA with an active research uh, portfolio and a laboratory and all of that with my colleagues uh, at the time at the University of Miami. And we sort of wrapped that all up and moved it up the street to Nova Southeastern University, still in partnership with the VA. So to this day, I still have a lot of my laboratories. I have laboratories at the VA. And uh, we have a very um, amazing clinical research program that's based at the Miami VA in partnership with the Institute with, for Neuroimmune Medicine. And we have at our sites um, also labs and clinical research as well as clinical care. Programs. And Jimmy, you have a very special place with us at INIM. Can you share with our community 
how the relationship began and how it's how it's evolved over time. I appreciate that because that's an introduction to um, the level of advocacy that I started out with with the INIM and then subsequent took a job with the INIM, which was really awesome. Um, I was actually reading Dr. Klimas's, uh productions, her work, and uh, I was reading one of her studies and I moused over her name and her email appeared. <laughs> I, Uh-oh. So I was, and there and there it began. There it began. I emailed her immediately, and I will tell you most directly what I encountered. I encountered the most kind, caring, committed doctor I've Absolutely. ever met in my entire life, and here we are today. And so, were you personally dealing with some of the symptoms associated with GWI? Were you working with in involving myself with research? What I discovered was understanding more about what was going on with my body, putting labels on what was going on with my body so that when I went back to my primary care doctor at the Veterans Administration, I was having much better conversations, letting the doctor understand what was going on. So at the same time I was experiencing the wonders of research, I was taking this back to the VA for clinical support. And subsequently I was ultimately diagnosed with Gulf War illness. It took, it took some time would have never made it there without the research, without Dr. Klimas. Thank you, Dr. Klimas. <laughs> he says such an important thing because so many veterans who have had these toxic exposures haven't associated their illness that they have with the toxic exposure. Exactly. And so they are just out there floating, not understanding what's going on. And so I, the VA has become incredibly aware of the downstream effects of toxic exposures. Mm-hmm. This whole recent PASC Act was really wrapped around yes. um, taking responsibility as a country for the harm, the harm's way that we put our active duty personnel. Can can I ask you just to mention that act one more time, please? The PASC Act, P-A-S-C. It was just the last, what, two years that the PASC yes. Act came into being, but it basically gave the VA the resources to... Um, do us right, you know, both in terms of disability payments, but also in terms of uh, training, you know, legions of physicians to be more in tune with and understand what they're seeing when someone walks in with a toxic injury. And from what I understand, it's, it's just difficult, both from the individual that's dealing with this, but also for so many physicians to identify this. Can you help the people that are sitting out here? And, and can you give me the time span also that we're looking at. You had mentioned early on the time of the conflict and the time of the exposure that we're studying right now. Right. So in Gulf War illness, which is just one of many toxic exposures our poor veterans have been through, um, but in Gulf War illness, the the conflict was in 1990 and 1991. Okay. It's a seven-month deployment deployment in most cases, or some people that stayed a lot longer to clean up. But the... um, but anyway, in that in that period of time, uh, as I said, these veterans had a tremendously excessive uh, exposure. Work by our group and others has demonstrated that the people that were at greatest risk for these um, for staying sick, uh, you could sort it out because we discovered that genetically they were slow detoxifiers; that they basically could accumulate poison. They couldn't get it out of their bodies fast enough. So now we understand from a lot of hard work by our group, the group in Houston and and some other really outstanding investigators um, uh, that um, there was a, an obvious problem. Uh, so, so can you help me grasp? Uh, I understand the exposure. I, I now I do. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What, what, how would this present? How did this present in your patients? How is this presenting in your, the individuals that you are with and spend time with? How does that present? You have to give me the right term. I want to use the term colleague, but I think it's much more than that when you're in military service together. Well, we're a cohort. A cohort. Yes, we're okay. a cohort. I we're love a cohort. that. We're a deployed cohort of actually 700,000 that deployed to the Persian Gulf War, 1990, 1991, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Very specific cohort, very specific in the focus by the research clinicians on this challenge. Wonderful. And so there's been some real variables that are defined with that cohort or that group of individuals. Dr. Klimas, what are the patients presenting like? If someone's out there and they're maybe dealing with a lot of different things going on in their bodies, how can they identify this? So uh, there were 
people have been aging as this goes on since we're talking 32 years. So you can imagine early on that what people were presenting with when they first came back in the first four or five years afterwards, skin rashes, profound fatigue, body aches, what people call brain fog, trouble concentrating and thinking, um, GI, a lot of GI disturbances. Um, and because they had an awful lot of, of burn pit and oil exposures, a lot of lung bronchitis and chest things. As time went by in the first 10 years, there was also um, a series of cases of cancer that have worried everyone. There were, it wasn't enough to trigger a huge risk, but uh, Joe Biden's son is a good example, right? A Gulf War illness, a Gulf War veteran who died of brain cancer. We actually saw these rare cancers for a while. Since then, a little less of that, but now as people are getting older and they're in their 50s and 60s and even their 70s, what, a quarter to a third of the veterans um, were um, reservists. So they're already older when they got there. Right. So we have some, uh, some, some veterans of that war now that are actually in their 90s that, are, that were in their 30s and 40s when they were deployed. Right. So, um, or even older. So anyway, now where they're at is that they have the, that brain fog. It's a great big thing, attention, concentration, um, mental fatigue, trouble concentrating. Um, the body aches and pains, often they'll carry the diagnosis of fibromyalgia because it's something we do know how to diagnose. Um, sometimes they carry the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. Absolutely. And veterans that have pursued their disability um, have often been labeled correctly with these comorbid conditions and that to help them um, as they went through the process of documenting their illness. But irritable bowel is also another common comorbidity. And um, and most of the chest stuff is mostly cleared up, but it's there's some, still some chronic bronchitis and that type of thing. So we, we're seeing a lot of individuals that are affected by this. Would you say out of the 700,000 people that were exposed. Well, 700,000 deployed, about one in three uh, came back with chronic multi-symptom illnesses. Okay. And that's according to the Veterans Administration. And, and do you feel like those are the individuals that have actually made it known that they're dealing with this? Or do you have concern that there's more people struggling? There's more people struggling. There's say. more. I mean, when I know, because when I'm recruiting a study and you recruit a study for healthy controls, deployed controls. Absolutely. And then you look at people who are um, sick and these people identify as sick. These healthy people, when you come and do their their labs evaluation, and their, yeah. you're like, eh, not so healthy. Yeah. So then you realize that some people have just been, you know, dogging through this thing and trying to bowl through life with it, despite they're carrying a fairly heavy load of symptoms. Absolutely. So the purpose of at the institute and our relationship with the VA is to do more trials, more studies, develop a treatment plan. Can you give me some indication of what, what the goal set is here? The Institute's overall mission is to help people with complex medical conditions. And there are different illnesses that sort of fall into that bag. You know, the post-viral illnesses now, post-COVID is a, a common long COVID common illness that we're now exploring. ME-CFS, which is frequently a post-viral illness. And lung and the Gulf War illness patients. And what they have in common, these three illnesses, is that the symptoms are very similar, similar because what's going on in the brain is very similar. So the body's what, response. Yeah. So you can imagine here's the brain, grand central for everything you do. It's in charge of, you know, your blood pressure and your pulse and the rate that your gut is, is digesting things and, and so on. Um, it's in charge of all your endocrine, um, things. It's in charge of, releasing anti-inflammatories from the endocrine system when you need them. So the immune, the immune system, the endocrine system, the brain, they're so tied together. Uh, so here we have a group of people, with all these different illnesses, but what they have in, in common is this brain hit that got them at the beginning, creating a cycle of inflammation in the brain as well as the body, but the brain and oxidative stress. Those two are so tied together. Help me for a moment. Pencils and crayons, just for the people like myself. <laughs> Pencils and crayons are so cute. I love it when you say that. Pencils and crayons. Talk so, to me about oxidative stress for a minute. So oxidative stress is, uh, you, you hear it a lot. And yes. A lot of people take antioxidants. So yes. Right, there's that. And it's it's got to do with your body's ability to manage the, if you would, the trash 
of energy. Every cell has to make energy. Right. And in making energy, it flips out some free radicals. And typically, they're grabbed up by a system that's in that cell and recycled back into energy. And in a perfect world, this perfect little figure eight of things is going on where you make energy, clean up the mess, make energy, clean up the mess, recycling all this. So the, the infrastructure of the yeah. cell Beautiful. is perfect. Beautiful. Yes. <laughs> when, that, when that fails, and inflammation can make it fail. Right. But so can lots of other things, including- Toxins, viruses. And lack of nutrients. Yes. You know, really important nutrients you need to maintain it. So if that fails and that figure eight starts looking a little skinny on one side, now you have a real problem in that cell. And Got it's it. going to make free radicals. It has to get rid of them and flips them out of the cell. Sometimes it flips the whole damaged- energy unit, the mitochondria out of the cell. And now you've got a setup for a vicious cycle of inflammation because the immune system sees that and has to react. The immune system drives more oxidative stress, makes more free radicals, and it goes on and on and on. And 32 years later, you're looking at the brain of someone whose insult was 32 years ago. Right. And and the continued insult of daily not being able to resolve it. Yes. Set a new yeah. homeostasis or a new status of health. Right. The, 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 and we do a lot of that work in our group talking about homeostasis. Yes. Which is there's a homeostasis, a network of a balance of, of good health, and that there's a network or balance of chronic ill health. And between these two is not a straight line, but a mountain. Yes. So everything we do in our fancy scientific way that we do it is trying to design ways to climb the mountain and drop the person back into the other side of the mountain towards good health. Right. So it's a very um, fascinating area of science. It's incredibly important. And perhaps later in this thing, I'll tell you some of the science we're doing that way. But this is, um, uh, we're, we're very passionate about this, not just because the science is exciting and how cool is it to be thinking about how to make a chronic illness that's been around for 30 years go away. Yes. That's, that's pretty you know, awesome kind of goal, but also that we're helping our veterans to serve this country and, and they deserve this. They deserve everything that we can do to try to get them right again. And, and yes, Jimmy, you do. Thank and you. absolutely. And, and that brings me to my question is you are a very dynamic human being. You have a lot of things to spend your time with. Sure. What is the inspiration and the motivation for all that you put into this? What is your, what is your hope? for people that are out there. Hope hope is 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 awesome. And and my hope started with uh unpackaging the uh the wonderful information that Dr. Klein has shared. So just imagine as an advocate, um I would take all this information in and then make it so that veterans could understand it. So just break it down, break down the components. Uh the VA was starting to kick in in the early days and they 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 uh, labeled the presumptives, which were chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, and fibromyalgia were the three presumptives associated, those are clinical side, associated with Gulf War illness. So, so there's the, a direct correlation there's is a what you're saying. There's a direct correlation. So the, that exposure that. caused those things to happen in the body. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. That's correct. Early day. So the VA, of course, the VA is not at the leading edge of research, but it gave me enough um, to start taking this advocacy out to veterans, which initially the advocacy started to get traction and quickly became outreach and recruitment because the reciprocal of all of this knowledge was participation in INEM research. So it was the, the best combination of two things were happening. Very tough to keep up. I'm a layman, so I'm keeping up with this <laughs> research doctor that's leading in the nation that her name is known and her work is known. And I'd say, look, I work for her. And this is what you can expect. What we, we can, can start, do. Yes, we, you can now have an expectation for quality of life. You can have expectation for understanding what's going on with your body. Again, expectations for better conversations with your, your, your healthcare providers and the Veterans Administration. Part of our system also includes benefits, something that the Veterans Administration, uh, the Veterans Benefits Administration calls uh, compensation and pay, which is an integral part of of injury on the battlefield. So that was part of the messaging as well. We took that to here we are today. So, so I want to see if I understand this correctly. Sure. So w with veterans right now, we have a population and that population is in need. The synergy that I see here is that we have this 
cutting-edge research happening at the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine. And so to marry those two together gives our veterans access to research that's happening in your institute. Is that correct? Right. I, the institute is set up to do basically everything that we we found we found like, like a gaps analysis if you would what would be the most exciting way to set up an institute that could translate what has been decades of basic science work laboratory work that has really started to give us the underpinnings of this complicated illness and be able to take that information design studies and move it to the human on the same side um, we do clinical care. So we have vet, yeah, our, our clinicians are taking care of veterans with, with uh, Gulf War illness and other, other conditions, both here and the, and the clinicians at the VA. And so, um, we're doing it all. We're taking care of veterans. We're doing bench work. We're doing translational work. And there's a little space between bench and translation that we also do, which is the animal studies or the in vitro studies, proof of concept studies. So, so if you throw that together, and one of the ways we approach this is to use, um, now it's called AI, but we artificial call it, intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we, we just called it really smart, smart people that do computer That know how biology. to use computers really well. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. And they do things that, you know, you mere mortals don't understand. They use things like chaos theory to try mm -hmm. to, to Absolutely. Connect, connect the dots. So we would do, here's our favorite study and the one that really launched our Gulf War cutting edge work. This illness is made worse when people exercise. People have really poor exercise tolerance. Well, instead of um, calling that uh, the focus of our work, we used it as an opportunity to say, hey, we have a way to look at what the mediators of relapse might be. So let's put people on a bike. You think our guys would let us put them on the bike? And they have men and women Gulf War vets have allowed signed up for this amazing study that we've completed that uh, we put them on a bike with a whole metabolic thing where you're breathing a your mask and measuring all kinds of stuff with an IV line in your arm that we're drawing bloods from every frequently. And we drew bloods nine times. Um, we put them on the bike about eight minutes because they don't have much exercise capacity. We bring them right up to the threshold. Um, it was called the aerobic threshold. But um, beyond that, they would have had a serious relapse, so we didn't press them beyond. But we drew bloods um, at the beginning at the threshold at 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours, the next day, all, all nine, nine times, nine tubes, nine different blood draws. And um, in those tubes of blood, we, we measured every neuropeptide, like all the hormones, all the cytokines, the things the immune system makes, um, the types of cells that were circulating in the immune system, how well they worked. And here's the big one, gene expression. So what genes got turned on or off in response to the exercise challenge? Not just knowing that before and after, but in what order, in wow, order of go. Absolutely. So if 24 hours after you've exercised, you're in a relapse and I drew a tube of blood, I'd find a lot of things wrong there, but I wouldn't know what started it. And if I wanted to just treat these, I'd be treating the tail of the dog. But if I want to really understand what happened in the first five minutes that induced the whole thing, I better have gotten a tube of blood at the five-minute mark. And so that's what we did. So, okay? so that type of a study, which requires that we have individuals that participate in the studies, is critical to develop the care to make the patient better, right? Exactly right. So, so is, is part of your role getting individuals involved in these studies? Yes, it is. It's essential <laughs> to my role. I get to share. I mean, I'm a very fortunate person because I get to share the the, the excitement and well, get to share. He did the bike. He yeah, was on the I bike. I did the bike. I did that. Uh, if you don't mind me saying post, post exertional malaise was a real, real big deal to deal with because the, it, it's like a big blanket on you, big wet blanket on you. And it just really drags you down. And it doesn't make sense to, I think, to a person who's used to getting benefit from physicality, mm -hmm. right? right? Most right. people in the military, I mean, one of the reasons the training is so intense. So so it was really, it, when I was reading about that, it was so such a dichotomy yes. as to what we, we train the, our men and women that are in the military to do. Mm -hmm. Be fit, be physical, you know, and, and now we're the in warriors. a situation, be warriors, yeah. yeah. And we're in a situation where taking that action 
creates a flare or a relapse or the disease to express itself even more strongly. That was yes. that was very profound for me to to read about individuals like yourself and the research that they're doing. Can you share um, some words of wisdom for individuals that are dealing with this that might be open to or considering coming into a trial? What was that experience like for you? Was there was it a positive outcome? Did you love us when you got to us? <laughs> How, what was that experience like? We want people to feel familiar with us and comfortable with us and know that we're working tirelessly every day to find solutions. That's a, that's a, an excellent question because we, some, we don't know what we're getting into when there's so many, so many messages and different messages and confusion. You know, we're veterans. We've like Dr. Kleiman said, we're warriors. We're, we're concerned. Why, why am I degrading? What's going on there? And when those answers start pouring in, and they do pour in, it's amazing what you start connecting the dots and you understand, wow, environmental exposure? I was exposed in that seven-month period during during the uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, 1990, 1991, Persian Gulf War? Yes, you were. And that realization, it made me turn off all the naysayers. And I have to be honest, the naysayers were coming from the Veterans Administration, not in a negative way, but in a way that we really don't understand either. Right. So I don't understand. My doctor doesn't understand. But that research doctor I saw last week, she had answers, right. not the definitive answers, but let's do this. Right. And I mean, talking and, about- And measure it. And measure it. And make sure, yes. yeah. And that's what's so important with yes. the research, right? That is. Is that we're not shooting in the dark. We're not just trying to do something and and kind of wishful thinking, hope. We There's parameters that are yes. set up to actually measure, you know, either absolutely the right direction and double down on it or not the right direction and pivot. Yes. If you're a, a Persian Gulf War veteran and you have questions about what's going on in your body- you owe it to yourself to uh, f- turn the page, go to the next step, ask the questions, have the conversations. Don't, there's no requirement to jump into this swimming pool or this warm tub. Just ask the questions. We have people that answer phones and can, can answer those questions that can lead to onboarding into research, which is a, 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 a powerful outcome. Dr. Klimas, I know that people listening to this podcast, there's going to be people that have either themselves or a loved one or a, a dear friend or a family member that is dealing or had this exposure, how can they participate with our studies and trials? There's so many different ways to, to find out more information. At our institute, um, we have a webpage, which is great, and it has a research section, and under there's Gulf War, and we have a lot of Gulf, Gulf War clinical trials. I think there's six or seven open trials right now that oh, are that's interventive wonderful. trials, the intervention studies. So and, and then I'm going to ask you, what's an intervention study? What's the means, difference there? Okay. There's different kinds of studies that people can volunteer for. Right. One of our easiest studies is called B-Brain. Is they just come in, we do a medical evaluation, they fill out some self-report forms, and we draw some blood that creates a biorepository that the whole nation scientists in Gulf War illness are dipping into regularly. That biorepository is supporting at least 30 other investigators in the country so that they don't have to recruit people. They can just call up and ask for samples of well-identified subjects. So the B-Brain is a really important study. It's out of Boston University, but our site's the, bi- the biorepository, and uh, veterans can come to the B-Brain through the Boston University um, website, which they just could Google Boston well, University. I'll get them that. And, yeah. Yep. Great. And they could find a site near them that's a part of B-Brain. It's all over the country. And they and then samples are sent to our laboratory where the biorepository, and then we're the ones that pull the samples. But we're also site, and people can come to our VA site for B-Brain, and they would, um, that's not an intervention study, but it's an incredibly important study. You can imagine how much, how if you have to stop and recruit subjects, you just took two years before you started your work so versus having it in the freezer and pull it out and ship it to me and let's get going. That's wonderful. So so, so how many individuals would we be looking for in that? B-Brain's got, I think, a goal of around 400 people. It's a little more than halfway done. Okay. So we're looking for another 100 or more people across the country. And, and do we, they need to be in Florida? No, no, no. Anywhere in the country. If they go, go to the website for... um 
for a bee brain, they would see a, local, a site nearest them, but there are sites all over the country. Wonderful. Uh, and that's a great way to go. But that's not an intervention study. So you asked me the difference between intervention and not. The not intervention studies are teaching us what's going on here. All right. So we get blood. We do like the exercise challenge I just talked mm-hmm. to. The first ones we did, those were all, um, let's learn a whole lot more about this illness so we can project what interventions we might be able to use. So they're all moving towards intervention, but they're not um, a treatment study. But we currently have very exciting interventional studies Absolutely. going on. Can a you tell us about them. those? So, um, yes. So this there's a consortia that's funded by the DOD called the Gulf War Illness Clinical Trials and Interventions Consortia. We call it GWICTIC. GWICTIC. I like that. GWICTIC. <laughs> and it's got six sites across the country um, that are a consortia of sites that are recruiting study subjects into different interventions. And it was developed from the DOD to try to, again, speed up and move out uh, new new translation uh, studies that, that need to be moved into the into, to, um, patient use. So call, they call that translation studies. When you go from the bench to the very first phase one study or, or a phase two study, the sec- second phase of that when you're doing more people. So the therapy in question is being actually administered. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Administered so, to the patient. Yeah. Okay. So in a typical um, fa- uh, clinical trial, there's um, a re- what's called randomization. You you come into a study. So like we have a study called NAC, just about to start, N-acetylcysteine. Very exciting study. I'm launching in the next two weeks. And a uh, national study all over the place and virtual. Anybody in the entire country can re- be recruited. And then you, if you're nowhere near a VA, you could still be recruited into this this study, which is exciting because it's a virtual arm. Anyway, the NAC study um, is an example of a study that's a phase two study, meaning that we already know it's safe. We already know it's got some promise. We need to know a whole lot more so that we And think- this is a natural supplement, right? A natural supplement. Okay. NAC. Nutraceutical grade. It's or a pharmaceutical nutraceutical. Grade. Yeah. Yep. People can buy NAC. And it is, uh, uh, um, in your body, it's turned into something called glutathione, which is that thing that grabs those free radicals I was talking about. So you need a lot of glutathione in your cells to be able to keep this whole machinery well balanced. And NAC not only does that, it does it in the brain. One of the problems that we have with all of our studies and we envision things is that in a dish or in 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 a computer model, we can find these answers. But if it doesn't get to the target tissue, which is the brain, what good is it? It's something called the blood-brain barrier. And if right. it doesn't cross, well then. So we're not only looking for the things that um, could help our veterans, but also does it, does it get to the target tissue and can it work? So so that study, the NAC study, um, is uh, part of the GWICTIC. How many how many uh, individuals are we looking for for about that? 180, I think. Oh, 180. Oh, yeah. my goodness. That's it's wonderful. Study. That's a big yeah. study. Yeah, it's and it's um and that's been very promising in phase one. Looks yes, yeah, very yeah. very exciting, very exciting. Yeah, and and Dr. Shungu, who's one of the co PIs of this study, did a preliminary study where he you can use um an image uh, called MRS spectroscopy when you put an MRI. Everyone knows what an MRI is, an MRI, but it's MRI with some fancy math afterwards that can look in your brain and tell you if you have oxidative stress in your brain and where. And he did an early study with NAC in Gulf War veterans and another one in MECFS patients. Um, and he could reverse two normal oxidative wow. stress with NAC. So he got it across and he could show an imaging change. So we're incredibly jazzed about this study. That's it's exciting. It's an incredibly important study. And of course, the veterans will know that if we don't prove stuff, it's not on the formulary. <laughs> so right. if we right. can't prove it, then it won't be accessible to veterans. So we, we really need to um So we need 180 individuals. We do. That were yeah. during, in that time period, and that may or may not be experiencing or have been identified with GWI, correct? I mean, they don't, do they have they to not have that? Know, but do they, they have can, to have that diagnosis before they can sign up for the study? No, they just have to have the symptoms. Wonderful. Right? So that okay. when there's a screening tool when you first sign up. Okay. We go through on the phone and just see if they meet the basic criteria. That's great. So we'll help them through that process. That is awesome. super. But I was talking in this concept of this about placebo control because in the NAC study, it's a placebo control study because it's a big study. So people are randomized to get the drug or to get placebo. And then we compare those two groups. That's great. Yeah. A lot of people are concerned that they might get the placebo. But if if people are understanding in research that we have to do it right, 
to give them truth and, and answers, and that these studies are short, you know, that we can get answers pretty quickly. How and, long is the study? Oh, Lord, you would have asked me a question. <laughs> that really That's okay. We don't have to answer it. I think it's a four-month intervention, but I'd have to go back. Okay. So, I, so I'm, I'm, no, I, I, well, should, I, I should scratch that, that question. No, that's yeah. a lot for when uh, everything else that that brain is held on to, I'm already in shock. So <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so, so actually, I was going to say for that study and for the record that the PIs of this study are um, the consortia, the Gulf Wellness Consortia. I'm the principal investigator with the, with the um with our colleagues at RTI, so the, what's RTI? Is, um, the place it's a it's an independent company that manages the data and the oh, platforms, wonderful. the stats, and a lot of the quality assurance issues. We have an extremely professional group there. That's great, and um, and the um, consortia has multiple projects with different PIs, so the meaning principal investigators. So I am not the principal investigator of this study. Dr. Sullivan, Kim Sullivan, and Dr. Shangu, Dakoma Shangu, are co-PIs of this study, and they're amazing scientists, and this is going to be the coolest study. Some of the people in this study are also getting the imaging done, depending on where they live and if they're near one of the sites that can do the imaging. That's exciting. So people in the New York and Boston yeah. area will go in and get the images done, too. What I understand is that doing this kinds of research is critical. We know there's a problem. We know individuals are struggling with this problem. Um, there's some very exciting treatment on the forefront. So Jimmy, what would you tell individuals that are that are struggling with these types of symptoms? What's critical that they act on right now? The most critical thing that that I dealt with personally was quality of life because I have family, I have friends. I want to wake up every day and be active, be integral in my community. Come in and do advocacy and work with the INIM, with Dr. Klimas, et cetera. So quality of life is critical. So so what <laughs> what action do people need to take? Should they participate in this these trials? Do we need volunteers? Yes. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> we we do. We just, need just we shout it out. <laughs> yes. Just, just it's a challenge accepted, damn it. I mean, come Let's on. Do you, this. Yeah. You're doing it for for yourself, you're doing it for us, you're doing it for the team. There's not only the the, the immediate demand, but as Dr. Klimos will will bring out, there's some concerns about um neurodegenerative issues uh, in later stage or early stage presentation of these of of challenges time is limited we live on a spectrum some of us are are not as well off as others and if we don't act if we don't do this for ourselves it's just tick tock time is flying and we we're missing the opportunity today and i also think that by participating in these studies and trials you're helping your comrades you're helping your Individ the individuals that were there shoulder to shoulder with you, right? Yes. We gain so much information from individuals like you participating in these studies and trials. You're empowered by it. Your life is changed by it. Yes. But it doesn't end there. It <laughs> You impact all the people that you were there with as well by allowing an institute like the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine to explore what's going on in the body and have the passion to wake up every day with the intention to find solutions. And so, Dr. Klimas, what 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 do we need people to do? So I can tell you that people ask me, why does it take so long to have something actually get into the hands of the people who need it? And I will answer it as someone who's very experienced. Recruitment, recruitment. recruitment recruitment. If it takes me four years to fill a study, that's four years that you had to wait. So, so it is taking me four years to fill studies. Let me say, let's get real. And the pandemic did not help one little bit. So if there is any way to tell folks clearly and, and, and in a way that rings every bell, please get in these studies so that we can get this out to you. I cannot promise you a study intervention that was successful unless I do this study. And I can't do this study unless I have enough people to do the study. So, And we're talking about a population of over 700,000 individuals. Mm -hmm. and But we need 180, 400 exactly. people to step up and allow us the opportunity to help them. Exactly right. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what we're asking. And we're asking it 
from the bottom of our hearts and with gratitude for the service. Absolutely. And with deep, deep creativity, because even though we were dealing with COVID, where we were locked down, the INIM was so resourceful that they came up with virtual way to participate, virtually in the way that you in your own hometown from your private home <laughs> right. can participate. You sure you find a, a blood lab. We help you find a blood lab in your community, but it's it's facilitative. It comes to you. There's little reason not to participate. Again, I, I throw out the challenge to to my colleagues. Come join in. The water's warm. So as the <laughs> host, I'm going to commit to you guys that I'm going to shorten the gap between getting to us from where you are today to getting to us at INIM so that you can start the process of participating in one of these trials, this research, and not only help your own health trajectory, but level up the health trajectory of everybody that was over there with you. Level up. Level up. Let's do it. So let me just do a quick little yep. spit on what we're trying to recruit. Yep. Just real quick, because not time enough to talk about each one. But um, this Gulf Wellness Clinical Trials Consortia which is amazing. I, I don't know what a consortium means. Okay. So um, the Gulf Wellness Clinical Trials Consortia is a consortium, meaning a, a group of people that came together to try to do it better. It implies that there's multiple sites and Got that it. they work collaboratively together. Okay. So this particular consortium is working with the New York, I um, mean, New Jersey VA, the Houston VA, the Palo Alto VA, um, Boston, Miami, and, and, but we also have other sites. People use our consortia to, to move their ideas forward. So, and I was talking before that, that your basic scientists can have this genius idea that's ready to translate. But if they don't have partners to translate it, it dies on the desk. You, know, you can do your whole life's work and never move it to actual human use because you didn't have a clinical partnership to do it. So, this is the clinical partnership. This is the, so a PhD can come to me and say, let's move this forward. And we do. So, we have studies going on at Ross Camp Institute. Um, Houston, we have another one in, at, at Waco. Um, we're helping other scientists, Dr. Younger in, 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 um, in Alabama. We're helping other people either get their studies off the ground or actually perform their studies for them um, or recruit their studies for them. So we're trying to help uh, everyone we can. And not, not, it's not just our little Miami group that's, that's um, engaged in this. It's, it's a national thing. The call to action for this is that we have the consortia. Uh, it was the advocacy of the Gulf Wellness uh, community that helped convince Congress to pay for this. And we put it all together and we are trying to implement it in our strongest possible way. We have multiple trials, seven or eight trials right now go underway. We need study subjects. Reach out and volunteer for this study. If you can't be a patient or a study subject in a study, but you know Gulf War vets, use your social media to roll this out, please. Send our links out, send our message out, get people to know about us because we're trying to find you. So we're going to put the links here available for you. But if, if I understand this correctly, we've put the time, energy, effort, gotten the resources together to put a ton of brilliant people that are like-minded that want to move this forward. And now what we need is veterans to step forward and participate in the trials. Absolutely. Okay. That is, that is the bottom line. Okay. Yep. And we also need your help in spreading the word. It is, there's a lot of chatter out there and there's a lot of promises out there. And there's a lot of conversation that maybe isn't uh, uh, netted the help that we need to get the veterans and we need to get it as quickly as possible. Time's ticking as you keep saying. I love that. Tick, tick, tick. tick, tick. Yeah. <laughs> so please make sure that you sign up, that you spread the word, that you help us on our mission to get the help that's needed for the individuals that are dealing with symptoms associated with GWI. And um, Dr. Klimas, if you can just share with us one more time. You just go to our webpage and you click on the link that is on the Gulf War Illness uh, Research Studies. It's a super short little survey that just tells us who you are and how to contact you and if you were ill or not ill, if you're a control or if you're a sick, sick person. And but the big thing, permission to contact. And then we will circle back and send you all kinds of information about our, our work and we'll reach out to you. So thank you. I need Persian Gulf War veterans. I need Persian Gulf War veterans that uh, returned from the Persian Gulf War, 1990, 1991, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, that have concerns, concerns about their health, any problems, any anything that they would like to have a, a, a discussion with research clinicians to bring out 
uh, the possibility of one having Gulf War illness is extremely important. It's, there's nothing to beat around the bush with. Our website is well laid out. There are hyperlinks that include contact directly to me. And what I want you to do right now is we have a very short survey, a three-question survey. I've taken it myself, very simple, that identifies you as a Persian Gulf War veteran and allows us to contact you. You have to opt in for us to reach you. So people who participate in studies have other added benefits that the real reason to be in it is because you're for the greater good that you're teaching us what we need to know to be able to help the most people. But you personally do get benefits. We do thorough evaluations. We do hundreds of dollars worth of lab work. We do a lot, a lot of personal work. And often just by virtue of meeting our entry criteria, we validate that you have the illness and it helps with the disability assessments and all that type of thing. So while uh, we press a lot on do this because it's the right thing to do. It's also a good thing for you to do personally. And so this can give a person access to maybe resources that they haven't been able to get access to. Yes, and and, and deep looks into their own bodies. Awesome. At That's great. Some other time we'll talk about Project In Depth, which actually involves a two-week inpatient stay at the NIH where they look at every, all the way down to them, intracellular level, so what is going on. That's great. So there's people that can participate in their own home and people that can come inpatient and participate as well. Exactly right. Wonderful. It's pretty cool. What else? We're going to get the answer to this. Before we uh, run out of time, I need to mention our long COVID study. Perfect. It's called um, COVID Up, which is COVID, Understanding the Post-Viral Phase great name because we like to do that in science, I make complicated names. But the idea is that there are a group of people in this country, probably in the million plus range, who never completely recovered from COVID. Some of them didn't recover because COVID damaged something important like their heart or their lungs or their, their kidney. But those are the small numbers. The huge number are these people that have a post-viral illness that looks for all the world like an illness that we have been studying for 30 plus years myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome. So CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome has been around for a long time. It's one of my, see the gray hair? I've been, I, one of my very first papers I published when I was just a little baby doctor was on chronic fatigue syndrome in the early stages. I've been doing it that long. And we've got a lot of experience with, um, with ME-CFS patients and with research. And it was our question whether or not these long COVID patients had the same thing or not, or could we apply things we've learned from ME-CFS to help our long COVID patients and perhaps get them into a better health state sooner. So the CDC, bless them, funded us to do a comparator study. And we're, we are busily recruiting hundreds of long COVID patients into a platform uh, where they do self-report stuff about themselves. And from that group, we pull in uh, a subgroup of 200 people. It's a big study to bring into our clinics and do what's called a deep phenotyping study where we're looking at doing echoes and looking at their hearts and lungs, but we're really looking intensely at their immune systems and, and their cell functions and things like that to see if we can find uh, the underpinnings of long COVID, and if it looks a lot like the same thing we're seeing in MECFS or not, so that we can understand that. So this is a study that's been hard to recruit because it's um, a South Florida study. People have to be able to come into our clinic, so that's regionally a South Florida study, and we were reaching out to them through their hospital systems, and we sent out, I'm not exaggerating to say that there's been at least 80,000 emails sent out but we've all been trained not to click on emails. Right. So you send out 15,000 emails and you get 300 people. Literally, that's all. 300 people open the email. Oh, man, it's just killing us to recruit the study because people don't even know we're doing it, so, even though they've been in invited to be a participant. So this is these are individuals that are dealing with COVID long hauler symptoms. Mm -hmm. and, and they have to live in South Florida. Yep. They're either long haulers or they're not. They're people who had COVID. At any time during the, the pandemic, okay. they had COVID and they either recovered or they didn't. And they can volunteer through any either one of those doors. And how many people are we looking to recruit? Oh, we were hoping for 800 when we started out. We'd be happy if we get the 200 in. We're going to stop when we get to the number that we're trying to bring in for phenotyping. And we, I think we've only gotten about 60 or 70. We have 280 people in the study right now. And we have maybe 70 or 80 that were eligible for the, for the next step. Okay. So we need to double those numbers up. 
Okay. I need probably another 300 to be able to to fill it out. So right now we're looking for 300 individuals that had COVID, mm-hmm. whether they recovered or did not recover. Yeah. And we, we'd like a lot of unrecovered people okay. in that. So specifically, I'd like to see individuals that have um, some symptoms associated with COVID long haulers yep. that haven't reached full recovery. Exactly. And we need that now. Exactly right. And the symptom we're really most interested in to start is this fatigue. Every time I try to do something, I feel like I want to just lay up sorry afterwards. That is the symptom that is central to MECFS, and it seems to be central to long COVID. So we're grabbing the fatigue patients up, and if they have other symptoms, we're counting those too. We're great. doing a good evaluation. But we really do need to see them. And, where and do they we- get this great thing. They go to the most expert site in South Florida that really understands post-viral illness, and they get a thorough evaluation. It's a, it's a, it's a big plus. And where do they sign up for this? Cause I know we're going to get tons of individuals. Go to my webpage. Good. <laughs> Here's a link and there's a QR code. You can click the QR code. It takes you to a short little survey, another little short survey that, um, finds out if you recovered or you didn't recover, if you live in our area and where you got your healthcare. We're trying to figure out who your healthcare systems, if you went to Baptist or, you know, um, Broward Health or whatever your healthcare system might be. And whether or not you're in there, we still want you to come through. It was just how we filter people into different different things. I have something proud to say about this study. Because we recruited through this way where we didn't just ask for volunteers or recruit from our clinics, but rather we went from the healthcare systems, we have the most beautifully representative demographic of this community. More than half of our study subjects are Hispanic, as is our community. 17% are African American, as is our community. It's beautifully done, and you won't see that in most studies. So we're trying to stay true to our community, and we need to know. We need to know whether or not people who um, had this uh, illness, if they have a a higher risk for this or that, depending on being Hispanic or not Hispanic or black or white or whatever, but also um, age and when you got sick, when did the symptoms start? Was it with Delta or with Alpha or Beta or Omicron? You know, all these things are important questions. So right now we need people to go to the website, mm-hmm. click the QR code, if I could say that 10 times fast. Mm-hmm. And if you are in South Florida and you're dealing with COVID long hauler, you're having symptoms of fatigue, exhaustion, exercise induced malaise, any of those types of things, Please, please, please sign up for this trial today. Absolutely. Please do. Perfect. Thank you. 